Hello, I'm Simon Whistler. You're watching the Today I Found Our YouTube channel. And in the video today, we're looking at the trials and tribulations of 1904's Olympic marathon runners. When the United States hosted the Olympics for the first time in 1904, the Games had yet to reach the high level of competition and popularity that we know today. Although athletes from countries around the world were invited to participate, the Games were less about the world's best athletes competing for medals and more about actual amateur athletes competing against each other. The ultimate decision to host the 1904 Olympic Games in St. Louis, Missouri, created a huge obstacle for international athletes in that travel to the innermost parts of the United States was difficult and costly. The only way to travel between continents was by a long and expensive ocean voyage, after which the athletes needed to take about a 1,000 mile train trip. As a result, many countries decided not to participate. Out of the 630 athletes from 12 nations that competed that year, 523 were American, which explains why the United States won so many medals that year, 239 with the closest runner-up being Germany, who won 13. Perhaps one of the most surprising athletes to compete for his country was Félix de la Caridad Carival y Soto, also known as Félix Carvajal from Cuba. With no formal training and a running technique that left much to be desired, this mailman raised his own money to travel to St. Louis to represent his country in the Olympic marathon race. Despite his work as a mailman, Félix lived his life in poverty and was denied financial assistance from his local government to cover expenses that he would incur on his journey to the Olympics. He spent days running around town and begging people for money to help him on his pursuit. His efforts paid off, and he raised enough money for a trip to New Orleans, then he promptly lost his remaining funds on a game of dice. Not to be deterred, he hitchhiked the remaining 650 or so miles to his destination. Due to his jovial nature, he befriended the men on the American weightlifters team who gave him room and board as he prepared for the marathon. The 1904 marathon for the Olympics started around 3 p.m. in the afternoon in August with temperatures above 90 degrees. Anyone who knows about summer weather in St. Louis knows that the oppressive heat and humidity are not friends to anyone, certainly not to the 32 men representing four different countries running a 24.85 mile marathon. To make the situation worse, the only access the runners had to water on the course was at mile 6 and 12. For some, especially those who didn't have a support vehicle or support staff to aid them, that made for a very long and torturous race. Carvajal showed up to the starting line wearing a long sleeve shirt, pants, and boots. Considering other runners were in shorts and tank tops, we can only assume these were the only clothes he had with him. Legendary athlete Jim Thorpe once actually did something similar at the Olympics wearing different sized shoes, neither of which fit him, that he'd scrounged out of a garbage bin shortly before a race. As for Carvajal, seconds before the start of the race, an American discus thrower found a pair of scissors and made a mock pair of shorts out of Carvajal's pants for a more athletic looking attire. The start of the race required runners to complete five laps around the stadium before heading off into St. Louis County. The course was certainly not shy on delivering obstacles for the athletes. Through the streets of St. Louis in order to stay on the course, runners had to dodge cars, delivery wagons, railroad trains, trolley cars, and people walking their dogs. In places, the roads were covered with cracked stone that the runners had to pick their way through. If all of that wasn't enough, there were the seven 100 to 300 foot hills, noxious exhaust fumes from the early automobiles, including support vehicles and others following the runners along as they went, and the extreme amounts of dust kicked into the air by these vehicles and horses. Car fumes and dust coupled with with the heat and humidity soon took its toll on the runners. One of the first to drop out of the race was John Lorden of Massachusetts. In 1903, Lorden won the Boston Marathon, but he only made it 10 miles in this Olympic marathon before he started vomiting and pulled out of the race. The winner of the 1904 Boston Marathon, Michael Spring of New York, started out the Olympic marathon strong, leading the pack, but when ascending one of the steep hills, he collapsed from exhaustion and couldn't continue. William Garcia from San Francisco almost became the first death in the Olympic Games when he was found lying unconscious in a ditch on the course and was raced to the hospital. Fortunately, despite the extreme amount of dust he had inhaled, which did a major number on his esophagus and lungs, he eventually recovered and was able to race again. Another notable feature of this particular marathon was that it saw the first two black Africans competing in the Olympics. However, neither Len Tuyan nor Yan Mashiani were seasoned marathon runners, but both had served as dispatch runners in the South African Boer War. They were in town as part of the Boer War exhibit at the world's fair and decided to enter the race on a whim. Both finished, placing 9th and 12th respectively. 
It was reported the tower would have probably placed higher if he hadn't been chased over a mile off the course by a wild dog. American Frederick Laws was also a contender for one of the top spots early on in the race, but he suffered from severe cramps and at nine miles was unable to continue. He decided to hitch a ride in one of the cars back to the stadium, but the car broke down before arriving at its destination. Feeling refreshed, Laws started running again. When he entered the stadium three hours after the start of the race, the crowd erupted in applause for the winner. Unable to resist the crowd, Laws went along with the facade, racing toward the finish line and basking in the limelight. Perhaps he really was trying to take credit for the win, or perhaps he was just in it for the fun and games, as he later claimed. Either way, when it was quickly noted by certain spectators that Laws had been seen riding in a car during the race, the officials saw no humor in his prank and banned Laws for life from participating in amateur races. However, Less than a year later, the ban was lifted after Laws apologized for his stunt. He went on to take first place in the 1905 Boston Marathon. When another leading runner, Thomas Hicks from the United States, learned of Laws' supposed win, he begged his two assistants to let him drop out because he was in so much pain. They refused to let him quit, and like many other runners, Hicks's health took a plunge early in the race and continuously declined as he ran. For some bizarre reason, his handlers refused to give him water to drink during the race and instead sponged out his mouth using warm distilled water and then proceeded to feed him egg whites and strychnine. Yep, that's strychnine. You see, at the time, strychnine was used in small doses as a performance-enhancing drug. Anything but small doses would, of course, kill the athlete via asphyxiation due to paralysis of the respiratory muscles. However, in small doses, strychnine was believed to provide a performance boost via muscle spasms that it relatively quickly induces. Unfortunately for Hicks, besides refusing him water to drink, his handlers didn't stop with one dose of the poison. In total, during the race, he was given approximately 2 to 3 milligrams of strychnine, plus the raw eggs and brandy that accompanied each dose. Unsurprisingly, with the extreme heat, humidity, dust clouds, dehydration, and being fed rat poison, Hicks's condition continually grew worse, and he ultimately became delusional. Nevertheless, he continued to put one foot in front of the other, and he soldiered on. Entering the stadium for the last stretch of the race, Hicks required physical assistance from his handlers, who had to practically carry him over the finish line. Of course, this would result in a disqualification in today's Olympics, but in 1904, the act was completely legal. Hicks was initially unable to receive his gold medal given that he fell unconscious at the finish line, and it took doctors about an hour to revive him. Close to death, fortunately, he eventually recovered, though retired from competing in marathons. With a time of 3 hours 28 minutes and 53 seconds, Hicks's feat is the slowest time for a men's Olympic marathon in history. The United States claimed the silver and bronze medals in the marathon as well when Albert Corrie crossed the finish line six minutes after Hicks, soon followed by Arthur Newton with a time of 3 hours 47 minutes and 33 seconds. Although both runners struggled with the heat and dust and slowed down to a walk during certain parts of the race, neither seemed to have it worse than Hicks. Meanwhile, Felix Carvajal ran at a comfortable pace. Unable to resist charming the spectators who lined up along the way, Felix often stopped to chat with them in his broken English as well as crack jokes. With his upbeat and good-spirited attitude, he won the hearts of many along the course. When he begged for peaches from the occupants of an accompanying car and was refused, he teasingly snatched a couple from them anyway and kept on running, eating the peaches as he ran. Most accounts of the marathon say Carvajal needed a bit more sustenance, so he snuck into an apple orchard and plucked two of the juicy fruits from the trees. Supposedly, the apples didn't sit well with him and he suffered from cramps, which forced him to rest and purportedly take a cat napper before continuing the race. However, it should be noted that there is no no contemporary evidence that this actually took place, with the first account of it popping up in William Henry's 1948 and approved history of the Olympics. Regardless, the temporary accounts of Carvajal's approach to the race seem to describe an individual having a blast, while many other racers struggled to overcome bodily limitations. Felix Carvajal crossed the line in fourth place, though his time is unknown today. Compared to the other racers, he was described as seeming to float across the finish line. Aside from probably being a bit tired and hungry, the heat and humidity didn't seem to have too much of an effect on the Cuban. While it's not known how far behind third place he was, accounts of the day indicate if it wasn't for his numerous stops to chat with people during the race, Carvajal may well have won. Whatever the case, these Olympics ended up being the only international competitive race Carvajal would ever compete in. In the end, only 14 of the original 32 racers managed to cross the finish line. As for the victor, although the assistance Hicks received proved mostly to be detrimental, he was able to finish the race thanks to being carried along near the end, a fact that resulted in some feeling like he should have been disqualified. After the race, a complaint towards this end was filed by Everett Brown, the chairman for the Chicago Athletic Association. However, the Olympic Games director refused to consider the matter, and Hicks remains the winner. And now for a bonus fact. In the 1500s, most Catholic countries in Scotland adopted the Gregorian calendar, established by Pope Gregory 
Gregory XIII to compensate for the errors in time that had built up over the centuries. This calendar was introduced over the Julian calendar, which was introduced by Julius Caesar in 45 BC. A lot of Protestant countries, however, ignored this new calendar for another 200 years or so. England stuck to the Julian calendar until 1751 before finally making the switch. Orthodox countries took even longer to accept the change. Russia, for one, did not convert to the Gregorian calendar until after the Russian Revolution in 1917. But what does this have to do with the Olympics? Well, in 1908, the Russian Olympic team arrived 12 days late to the London Olympics because of this. So, I really hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below, and don't forget to subscribe for brand new videos just like this every day of the week. Also, if you'd like to help support us at Today I Found Out in making these daily videos, please do consider becoming a Patreon. You can do that at patreon.com forward slash Today I Found Out. We've got loads of great perks lined up for people who do support us. And as always, thank you for watching.